be like, like a, a yeah, good yeah, company. Yeah, well, 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 well. <laughs> Okay, we're going to start. Good evening, everybody, and welcome here at the studio, well, at the studio, at the Independence Conference. It feels like studio. And also everybody who is following on live stream on YouTube. We are a bit late, but we, um, there, we have an intensive day, so this is uh, the reason. Um, welcome at this lecture evening, which is part of the Summer School Let's Be Real, in which we will try to find new and alternative strategies for affordable housing. Uh, and this lecture evening is, uh, this, today we started the summer school, it was really intense with all kinds of introductions and lectures and also an intensive expedition to the city. Everybody's just coming back, so now we're going to start with the lecture evening. Um, we have three uh, masters of the summer school who will present to, uh, tonight from their own expertise and own experience on the topic of affordable housing. And we will, I will give you just a short introduction on the, the speakers and then I'll leave the floor to them. And then afterwards we have uh, time to discuss and uh, have some questions. Uh, and if you have questions also in the chat, then please let us know. So we start with um, Tessa Steenkamp. Yes. And she is um, an urban interaction designer, designer, designing interactions within cities rather than with screens. She is trained as, as an industrial designer in Eindhoven's University of Technology and later specialized in emergent technologies and design at the AA School of Architecture in London. With her design practice, Bits of Space, Tessa gives shape to the relations and interactions between people, technology, and the built environment. So yes. the floor is yours, and later I will explain that. I'll talk all about that. <laughs> um, Right, so uh, I recently started a company called Bits of Space, started last January. Before that I worked for an architecture company and before that for a municipality. So I've kind of approached the same topic from uh, all different kinds of perspectives. And uh, what I like to do is um, yeah, giving shape to the relations between people, their built environment and the technology they use to kind of navigate in this. And I took this picture today. <laughs> I almost forgot I put it in, but I see all your surprised faces. Um, I took it because I think it's really symbolic for how we experience the world and not just that it's not like a critique, it's, but I just find it so interesting that there's this one man who protests and probably the whole country has seen him on TV already and people go there and take photos and then they upload these photos to social media and then people in Venezuela see this and then get inspired by that and it's not just that we look through, through a screen at it, but it just reaches a lot wider public and we experience the world in a different way and make connections in a different way. So I took a lot of photos like this today. <laughs> um, yeah, so Simone already said it, uh, I call myself an urban interaction designer. That's not a real thing, but I'm making it a real thing. Um, and I'll explain it a bit. I'm, I'm a bit on a mission to make it a profession. So I, um, I like to see the city as an interface. Interaction designers, they, they design interfaces. And for me, it's an interface between individuals and society. So, for example, I think Fred already said today, if we were all just standing on one big field, uh, we would still be a city, but we wouldn't be able to find each other at all. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the festival, like, one and a half year back. But it's really hard to find your friends once you lose them. And it's really hard to find back your tent. And it's because there's no landmarks. Uh, there's There's nothing that you recognize, no shape to interact with or through. Um, and the internet is also an interface between individuals and um, society. So on the left you see a map of the internet, there's been many like this made. This is kind of the structure of what it looks like. Uh, and on the right you see an analysis of my own LinkedIn profile. Um, basically every dot is a contact and then they're connected to other people that I know but they also know. Um, and you see these kind of virtual neighborhoods almost arising from people that I know from when I lived in Eindhoven and people that I know from living in London. Um, yeah, so, so um, yeah, virtual neighborhoods in such a way that are not just surrounded around a geographical location but also around an interest really. Um, and I find that really fascinating. Um, 
But then often, I think for the past 20 years, there's been talk about bringing the internet and the city together into a smart city. And if you Google that, this is what you get. Um, a lot of transparent buildings, blue lines, lasers, fancy stuff. No one really knows what it looks like when you use both of these interfaces. Um, but in reality, it looks a bit like this. Um, on the left, this is a tunnel close to my hometown. It, it has this sign, but I, I wonder how many people stopped, stepped off the bike, typed in the URL. That's just not an experience or a thing people do. Um, except for me, I did it, and the URL is not working anymore. <laughs> so you see that this, this rate of change online and offline, there are different, different rates of change, and they don't align very well. And on the right, um, these are uh, rental bikes. I just heard that you still have them in Rotterdam. Simon just took one, I heard. Right? <laughs> um, but in Amsterdam, they were, um, from one day to the other, they put 10,000, I think, in the city. Um, and people in Amsterdam did not like this because they had no place to park their own bike anymore. Uh, and they thought it was a commercialization of public space. Uh, so they threw the bikes out onto the streets and into the canals and they were removed mm -hmm. within a few weeks. Um, and I'm sure that the, the app behind this is completely optimized in how you use it. It's like A-B tested and everything. But then they, they never thought about the physical place that this will take in, which I find really interesting. So, um, so I'll talk about one project quite quickly. Um, trying to design both digital and physical at the same time as one experience. Um, the project's called Permanently Temporary. I started it about nine years ago and it's still going strong. It just, it, it keeps coming back. Um, so a tiny bit more theory. Uh, I really like the book A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. I'm sure a lot of you know it. It kind of describes the city as a code, like a website almost. Um, and one of the chapters is called Mosaic of Subcultures, and he basically argues that um, if you have a completely heterogeneous city, it actually creates really weak characters because people never have anything in common and they, they kind of converse on the, on the surface. But if you have the other sites where people only are in a neighborhood with people from their own subculture and rhythms and, and rituals that they know, you get kind of ghettos. Um, you're never challenged uh, out of your beliefs. So in the middle, this mosaic of subculture is where you can find a neighborhood where you can be yourself and see people with similar rituals and rhythms. Um, but then on the streets, you also see other subcultures. And that's public space and this is where you get challenged. Um, and I think the digital layer in our cities has had quite an effect on this. Um, to give an example, uh, this is uh, the VMD, which is a big uh, department store in the Netherlands that went bankrupt. Uh, this is in Amsterdam and a few years ago it was the Bout restaurant, which is a pop-up restaurant that appears in different locations. I think it's in its seventh location now in Amsterdam, but it always attracts the same crowd. So it doesn't matter where it is, the location doesn't matter anymore. People just type on Google Maps Bout and then they cycle there. Um, so it's not a heart of the neighborhood anymore, it's more a heart of an interest. Uh, of this online virtual neighborhood. Um, another interesting example I find, I made this map um, of Airbnbs in Amsterdam in, on one night in October 2019. And then on the right you see hotels, um, which of course is a bit distorted because hotels, they host a lot more people than Airbnbs do, but there are a lot more. <laughs> um, but the thing is also that this is just one night, and the next night it might look completely different because it might not be an Airbnb for that night. People might live there, so everything's kind of flexible and not fixed to a specific location anymore. Um, and people are guided to this Airbnb by their Google Maps, not really looking around. So what you get is that it looks really heterogeneous, a city, and it looks really mixed and um, maybe even like a mosaic of subculture, but how we experience it is we stay in our own filter bubble, but in physical space. So what we need is flash mobs. <laughs> I really like flash mobs. Um, they're a bit old-fashioned, I think, uh, 20 years old now. 
but what they are is online communities coming together and then showing themselves in public space, surprising people with other subcultures. And um, one of my missions for this project has been to design functional flash mobs. And um, I read about this mall in the US uh, where they used, uh, before the shops would open, they would use it as a running track because it had really uh, long stretches, uh, long hallways, and it was air conditioned and there's toilets and there's a water fountain. So it has the perfect spatial conditions to also be a running track um, and to shop. So could you take these two functions that require the same um, spatial qualities at different times? Could you expand that idea? And this is what I showed you this morning. This has been my mission a bit. Like, can you design for these specific combinations? So what would a mall look like if you would also design it to be a running track at the same time? Um, so how I started this eight years ago is by uh, taking a neighborhood in London called Shoreditch where there's three really different subcultures that never really speak to each other. Um, and then taking all the spaces available in this neighborhood, analyzing them on uh, spatial uh, qualities like sun exposure and visibility and accessibility from uh, metro stations and size, all those things. And I split up all possible functions. So I split uh, living into a living room, a bedroom, maybe a hotel reception, or like a, a shop into a storefront and a storage, well, etc. And then I just let it combine all those things. So these A squares, they indicate at which time of the day you would need the space for this function. Um, so uh, the first time slot was like during the night, then the second one was uh, from 9 to 5 during the day, and the third from 9 in the evening to 12. Um, and you get these three, three functions that could share space together, um, and then uh, that also probably host a completely different subculture, kind of creating these flash mob moments when they have to change the interior. Um, and I finished with, with just publishing all these different uh, combinations and requirements that you would need to design for those. Um, so uh, something that would come out is how could you design for something to be a coffee shop during the day, a hotel reception during the evening and a kebab shop at night? What would that look like? Um, I actually have a lot more, but I'll leave you with that because we're dealing with empty spaces and these kind of challenges. Um, yeah, I'll leave with that. Yeah. Um, we go on with the lectures and then in the end we will uh, talk, about, talk about flash mobs. Very yes, great. <laughs> okay, the second speaker is Frederik Leverat. He's going to talk about the Knowledge City. He's a UTT director and partner in Geneva and uh, New York. He holds a master in architecture from Lausanne Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland and has received numerous awards, such as the New York Foundation for the Arts in Architecture, Architecture, the Young Architectures Forum and the European Five Competition in Zurich. And he joined the New York firm Eastpac in September 2012 and taught at the Columbia University and Paris <coughs> Institute. It's very good that you're here. And uh, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, I join an interesting team here, but in fact, I don't know Tessa that much. but. It's great. I feel like I can continue on what she has been starting. Perfect. There's a lot of maybe hot homogeneity in those complex uh, discussion. Um, I know that we are we have been visiting today a very precise set of different housing and so on. But I want to almost open the question and ask a question like, what's a city for? Who is a city for? And uh, maybe that's where we would start. Now, we know that the city hasn't always existed as a main condition of living. There used to be much more people in kind of out of urban center, being peasant, taking care of the land. We have a tremendous confrontation. There's a nice picture of Dubai. 98% of what you see wasn't built 20 years ago, uh, including the tallest building in the world and things like that. We have more than 50% of the population living in city now. And I think we take for granted, like, yes, we have city, great. But I want to go and ask a question, what, what's a city for? What's a city 
actively for today. And corollaries, who is the city for? Who should have access? Who is generating, who is making the city? We went through COVID, we had a big crisis where the city did empty themselves, uh, where activity kind of stopped and changed. And I think it's a great opportunity to think about those questions. So that we know, uh, I've been working in New York those last 30 years, so a lot of reference would be about New York, but you can imagine the same for Rotterdam or other cities. Um, New York is a harbor where goods were coming from, but we don't manufacture good anymore. We have a business district center with a lot of people pushing paper, doing digital things, but we also realize that we don't really need uh, office center as a center of the city. Some people have been writing about how the digital revolution would in fact make the city disappear. William uh, Mitchell, who was a dean at MIT, wrote quite eloquently some nice book, How the City Would Really Be Dissolved Through the Digital Condition. But what we realize is exactly the opposite. Since the invention of the internet, many more people came into the city. People wanted to go beyond just information. They wanted context. So yes, the city allows us to be located and to be everywhere, anywhere, from anywhere. Um, and that's why I like to think about architecture as this interface, as this between condition, between the mind and the body, between the virtual and the physical. I've been working mostly as this notion between the virtual, the visual, and the physical. So the city, in that sense, and that's why I'm saying continuing the first lecture, the city as an interface, as a place that become a context for us to decipher information. Information without context doesn't mean anything. Uh, how much are we virtual? What do we mean by virtual? For me, virtual is condition in the mind. It's how we construct our mind, how we construct our perception. There's some nice quote here from uh, Noah Hariri, which basically explained that, you know, we could only organize ourselves as society if we accept that there is some intangible, some concept, some idea that are not part of the real. So a thing that link our society together, either if we say capitalism or uh, if we say rule of law, if we say democracy, all of those are idea. Even if we say Netherlands or Germany or USA, it's a concept, it's an idea. We work, we live in what we call, what Ari calls a cognitive revolution, where physical, our reality is not just physical, our reality is a layer of physical and virtual condition. So maybe we can read one of those. Ever since the cognitive revolution, sapiens have been living in a dual reality. I call it a multi-layer reality, but we'll go with duality. On the one hand, the objective reality of river, tree, and lion, and on the other hand, the imaginary reality of gods, nation, and corporation. I won't even go into the idea of religion and all of that, but you could imagine that being highly virtual or highly conceptualized, which nevertheless brought some of the most amazing architecture to, again, as trying to be this interface between a concept, an idea, a virtuality, and a body, our space. When I'm talking about the body and the virtual, we can also go back to the philosophy of Henry Bergson. Uh, in 1898, he wrote Matter and Memory, how we understand our environment. For instance, visually, we basically see dots of information, dots of black and white or color pixel, but in our brain, I mean, if you look through the room this way, you will make one room, even so you receive bits of information. The brain reconstitutes space, reconstitutes our environment as an active reader. So our brain is being designed, is being constructed through what we read, what we know, what we learn, and there are, in fact, people designing our virtuality. There are people designing what we recognize. Obviously, some artists have been playing with it since a long time. Uh, I could go back to Borromini, who started playing with this system of representation. This is Felice Varini, who makes us realize that we are more comfortable recognizing simple solution like a square into a square, which, in fact, is much more complex than that. But we don't want to see that. We want to see 
kind of the readapted simple image. So, do we see reality? Do we understand reality? Do we construct reality? Do we experience reality? So that's Borromini, also Renaissance. I forgot exactly when, I think it's 1690 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe you know more precisely. Uh, but again, this is a very short gallery, but it's constructed as a representation. So the representation becomes the rule for materialization. And then we have this ambiguous space. Is the space of the eyes? Is the space of the, that we reconstitute in our brain? Or is it the physical space? So the column here in the front are much bigger than the column in the back. I'm not going to go through it, but you can imagine it's a optic, it's a built optical illusion. So what it is or what it is about, <coughs> how is it at the same time existing in our mind or in the physical world? I decided to give you a Dutch connection here, that Hurry Boyk, who was studying those experiments where some little cats, as they were born, some could activate their movement related to the eyes, whilst another cat was not actively moving, but he would just perceive the world without moving his body, so the visual information is detached from the physical information, and that little cat never managed to walk after. He could not or bump into everything, because the relationship between our visual information context and our physical context is important. So in that sense, how do we start making an architecture to protect us from the human thinking? How do we make an architecture that shelter us or that explain to us the level of information that we receive? Eisenman did some experiment on that level. We're going fast, so we won't go into it. Marshall McLuhan very early started discussing about how much the media was a constructed environment, was constructing our environment. So, today we are experiencing a large part of the, our world through mediated information. We know about all sorts of plays from Iraq to Iran to Afghanistan to, without necessarily having been there. We know about whatever, the love story of those people without really knowing it. But, so what do we know? How do we know? How do we know that this election was won by this guy or that guy? Uh, if you look at Fox News or if you look at CNN, you might think you have different president. Uh, how much is it possible that the media are giving you so much information that you can't even translate it? So this idea of Borromini building a virtual reality, I mean, here you have Arnold Schwarzenegger, just because I didn't want to, to mention some other people, who started as a bodybuilder, as a terminator, and then became actually the governor of California. So that kind of inversion between the competence as a image, as a virtual, to the competence as an actual statesman is quite interesting. We were fed very early some lies and some idea that was really virtual, this idea of uh, weapon of mass destruction. So here there are some strategy of virtual condition and visual reinforcement that had tremendous effect on physical environment. You would have virtual condition but associated with hundreds of thousands of bombs and destruction and very personally, directly destruction. Um, very large country, empire are pushing to get the Olympics or things where they can be on television. They could make buildings that are more for existing on television and being experienced. And as Balachumi wrote at some point, fireworks become architecture. Um, so all of that to say that our city are changing, our city are becoming background for TV, for camera, for events that can be recorded, for tourists that can post on Instagram. It's very interesting that around Times Square, the price per square meter vertically is more expensive than the square, square, price per square meter horizontally. So. Do we live more for our eyes? Do we pay more for our eyes or do we pay more for our physical space? So all of that to go back into why do we want to be in city? Why do we want to live in places like Dubai or Mumbai or whatever? Here it's another piano of soccer, which itself is nice but not so important. But there was this necessity to confirm information. 
Uh, you were talking about flash mobs. There are other type of flash mobs. We saw that information also was possible to make people, like in Tahir Square, do some revolution, come together. Um, but for me, it's very interesting that what is essential for the city is the city as this knowledge city, as this ability not just to have information out of context, but to have information within a context, to be able to experience information into a physical context. From people to people, people to image, people to building, we need to have a context. So what does it do? How is the city generating information? accepting information, resisting information. Um, it's quite interesting if we take Manhattan, which is very expensive real estate, you realize that all those university, obviously charging students way too much money and all that, but nevertheless, information development, or at least knowledge development, education, is the fastest growing uh, business, if you want, in Manhattan. All those campus are building your NYU is exploding, the new school is building, it's being, Cornell is doing new campus, uh, Columbia is doubling in size. So it's certainly valuable to be in the city. You can't just learn, and you see here Columbia taking over, not the original campus, but really eating all of the neighborhood around it. So in that sense, and, and NYU being different, where they put just little flags, but they, there's no more campus, the city and the student are together. So in that sense, for me, it's very clear that just learning basic information or being subject to information, being subject to news, and et cetera, is kind of absurd. You need to test, you need to experience, you need to relate information and a context. And in that sense, the city is really the knowledge city. Now, if we accept that, it can be a campus, it can be a place to learn, it can be a place to interact, a place of knowledge. Well, all those students, they like it because here it's a kind of university city and there's a regular city, but it raises a question of what is a regular city? Who is living in that city? What is the city? So obviously a city is a place of interaction, but who has a right to the city? What do we know if we think that way? Okay. So new city is a knowledge city, but what, what is it? So we talked about today earlier that there are different inertia. You see different speed, different constituents. But for me, it's very important that the city is this heterogeneous condition. I mean, this is Mumbai, and you have some cows as much as you have some old building, as much as you have some commerce, uh, signage, internet uh, company, all sorts of things. That's what makes a city rich, is to have lots of different things, which in fact would be not always in sync with each other, but that would provide this kind of maybe resistance or condition. But it's very important if you want to have an heterogeneous city to have all sorts of people. So who is accepted? Who can be part of the city? In New York, super tall, super rich tower for the zero, zero, one person seems to be very much welcome, even so it's not really comfortable, it's moving because of the wind, it's kind of strange in the landscape. While squatters, this was on 13th Street and Avenue of B, uh, are met with tons of riot gears, police, and even a tank coming to dislodge a few families. So it's very important who has a right to the city, who can be in the city, who can actually be the city, live in the city, and on top of it, this slide we see the Black Lives Matter, uh, George Floyd, uh, kind of small memorial here. Uh, who gives the narrative to the city? If the city is about negotiating information, the city is also generating information. And is the information only generated by the usual CNN and ABC and I don't know what's the official uh, Dutch television? or can the people generate information? Now, we also know that if you are in the middle of Times Square and you make a project, you make a, a protest, something, you, it might be recorded, it might be seen. What if you're in the middle of nowhere? It's much more difficult. So it's very important not only who has a right to live in the city, but who has a right to generate, to 
provide information. So the city become an informational battleground too, um, where you have to not only have the right to live, but the right to provide a narrative. So it's very important that the city is complex. Sometimes the complexity of the city is not just by having one type of value. If the value is only capital, if the value is only how much a building costs, how much money you can do, how is that going to generate some complexity and some heterogeneity in the city? Uh, I'm showing here some community garden that are reclaimed, that are um, taken over, that are basically squatted uh, after building has been burning down. Those kind of non-building that don't generate any income to the city, don't generate tax, doesn't house anybody, in fact are very rich because they generate program, they generate community, they generate information exchange. Um, and in fact, they're, very, they're a lot more interesting than super high rise, super expensive condition, which don't generate much in the quality of the heterogeneous city. So I'm going to end up here with a kind of last slide, which is in Geneva, uh, a former uh, wastewater and uh, solid water treat, a uh, solid uh, material treatment that has been taken over as a squat, but the squat wants to make it into a cultural center. So I think it's, as we discuss again today, it's not just about housing, it's also everything that can be surrounding the housing. It's about making cultural center, about making activity, about feeding the information and negotiating the information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First, here about the flash mobs and then the complexity, the multi layered reality, maybe that we can combine in the coming days. Um, the third speaker is Alfredo Brillenbroek. He's going to talk about Torre David, I think. Alfredo Brillenbroek, you know already well, but he studied in architecture at Columbia University and at the Central University of uh, Venezuela in Caracas after which he co-founded the Urban Think Tank, an inter interdisciplinary design practice, and notable projects include the Caracas Metro, Cable, the Vertical Gym, and more recently the documentary and publication of Tara David. Um, William Book, you have taught at the Columbia University, you also co-founded the SLAM, and you held the Chair for Architecture and Urban Design at Zurich, ETH. Um, Used to. Used to. Now I'm in, in Oslo, yeah. You're in Oslo. Okay. Um, the floor is yours. Sure. So um, thank you, Fred and Tessa. That was uh, great because it was a good combination. Tessa wanting to to see how she can create new kinds of communities, right? You even uh, it was talked many times in the '60s. Australia is such a vast uh, uh, place that sometimes people had just radios between farms, and they would create communities through radio airwaves. So I think that's very interesting uh, in which way do we conceive communities, right? Because we're eventually going to talk about that more and more. And Fred, of course, uh, said, okay, community is good, but how do we perceive them? And who perceives them? How are they created? Who manipulates them? How are communities, um, let's say, perception? How is perception created? I will instead talk about the kind of working strategies inside out, correct? Um, inside and out. Well, new book is coming out. Always got to make a little uh, publicity for something. And it's coming out in September. So by 100 counts, 600 pages tells you how we started to do some transgression in Caracas. Now, just personal biography. I grew up between, I told you, two continents. And uh, or two, two cities and, and two nations and two cultures. This is Long Island City, and I used to ride my bike every, every summer as a six-year-old over this bridge, but what did I see over was the ghetto blocks. These were the social housing blocks of, uh, of Long Island City, and um, the Rockaways, what they call the Rockaways, and I remember how scared I was going on the, over that bridge. 
Um, and then the, on the other hand, you have Caracas, Petare, on the, on the right, is the largest barrio in the world, or, or, or do-it-yourself uh, informal settlement. But how curious that on the other side is absolutely symmetrical buildings, right? And you say, how did that happen? Well, the city's a political reality. And maybe that's what I'm going to bring in, is how we can transgress politics, how we can be activist architects, how we can use certain leverage that might be the, some of the th techniques that Tessa talked about, or it might be some of the ideas that Fred says is creating a new idea that people grab onto, right? Uh, um, so one would be the political where formal and informal meet. So how do we look for this this meeting point. We saw it today. You had formal housing blocks all around. Then you had a kind of informal squad in the middle. They'll say the school that we just visited now. But there's a tension there. And there's open space and barriers and gates between that tension. Huh? Then, well, we did a show, an exhibit, and, and a few publications that was about this yes and no, this binary. Right? We're always uh, voting yes or no, for or against, right? Um, but, and here is the uh, museum in Munich with it all over the facade. What are you for and what are you against, right? So we tried to bring in a kind of informal tent structure that was showing the projects that could be reused and reused and reused, right? And, but it was really asking above in the, in the red pieces is what is architecture about process or form? And of course, we see it as the city as a great laboratory. Now, if it's knowledge city, as Fred was referring to, then my question is, how do we remain free? Because if it's knowledge that's being given to us, or, or it is the city as a university now, we have to retain freedom. No one should control. Uh, the way we either our rights to the city or our ability to enter that city. So you know the Sur Global. This is the, all of this is a pixelated map that with real data that's telling you informality is in Southeast Asia, Africa, and a bit in South America, but it's in the South. Now, informality is growing. Why? Because that population is growing. These are the areas of the most population growth. Right? So what kind of cities are we doing? Is Europe then, you see it in very small, is it going to protect itself from this immigration? No. Globalization is unstoppable. So to that effect, there's a new magazine out, it might be around here, called Parangole, which I've decided to switch from making architecture magazines to making more urban sociology uh, magazines that start to examine these things, also hunch accounts, and done with uh, grip. Oh, I don't know if this will work, but here you see it. Basically, it tries to go around the world with articles, and all of you are welcome to submit any ideas and articles for the next issue, which will be um, in a year's time. And we're still working on the topics. So the need for detours. So why do I use publications? Publications are super useful because in a way, as Fred says, they, and we're going to make a manifest, because they create an idea. A book exists and it's physical and you can pass it on, right? You can also pass on PDFs, but somehow in our, in our desktop, it, things just get lost, right? A book doesn't. Um, so we need detours. We know that after COVID, as Fred uh, referred to, there is a death of the center of the cities. Why? Because office towers will no longer be as necessary. I mean, I'm sure we haven't seen the effects because financial markets are slow to adapt, construction is slow to adapt, but you will see a lot of empty buildings coming in the future. So, Torre Dadvi. Right? You know that this is the tallest squad in the world, or was. Ah, oh, the movie didn't go, but we don't have time for the movie. This is the book. It documents what was inside. As I told you, it was an abandoned office tower. Perfect. It describes the first point of the 21st century, which is um, globalization. 
Caracas and that developer wanted to be a global player, make his tower like in the Taj in Dubai or you know um, the Bur uh, Burj, Burj, no? And uh, but of course it wasn't in sync with the reality of where that country was going, which was left down the revolutionary path. So of course, after 17 years, the tower got squatted. Fantastic. With human endeavor, there was a real need for that squat because it was based on the, on the rains that I told you from 1998. And people needed a place to live urgently. And they slowly did the first floors, then the next, then the next. Here you see the interiors all fit out, carrying bricks up, and you say, if the government couldn't turn it into social housing or finish the building, the people with their own wills did, very poor people. So that means that there's something to this idea that a building should be hardware. I think uh, we heard Habraken's idea that maybe the infrastructure of the building, the structure of it is the hardware and the software is people, right? And hardware is relatively static and boring. What's interesting is the software is, the, is what goes inside that hardware, right? So the question is, is a squat, is it a slum? No, it's not a slum. What we saw today, the four or five places we went, North Torre, it has infrastructure, it has water, it has electricity, it has heat, you know, in the cases of what we saw today, you know? It has all the things, it has nothing to do with slums. Why? Because as the UN declares what slums are, slums are precarious constructions on the periphery of cities with no infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With, you know, one toilet per eight f uh, people or 10 people that they measure in terms of how many toilets. Right? So, but Torre David, fascinating. Here it sits the red, and we made a census of where people worked. People worked in the radius around the building. What could be more sustainable? The building was inhabited, finished by people themselves, organized an abandoned structure, and then people were giving services, cleaning, selling, all around the city, right? Fantastic. So we used these arguments to try to convince the government with the, uh, with the aval, we say aval, uh, but with the, with the, with the uh, support of the inhabitants themselves who knew that they were in a precarious situation, just like we heard today um, of making the city in the making, no? They are helping squats get somehow legitimized, no? And so the squat occupied all of this red uh, area here, and we documented what was happening on each floor. You can read it all in the book. We did uh, studies of all the, uh, the, the uh, electricity, stairwells, and all kinds of infrastructure that had been built. We then thought about how we could put little water tanks. How could people share electricity? Could we put little generators? Could we put wind turbines on the top? Could, what could we do to boom micro systems? So the sharing economy, very interesting. We wanted to redesign the whole building, right? We, we uh, improvised facades very cheap facades that could be built. And then we imagined even a public elevator tying into the metro. Go straight up to the building because the building was part of the extension of the city. No? This is Gladys. Without Gladys, we couldn't do it. She was in charge. She's in charge of the condominium of the cooperative. In fact, she has the golden line in her library. Because the Golden Lion, which you all know is, a, is, a, is whatever prize it is, it was given to the tower and to the community. Specifically, the jury said, to the inhabitants of the tower. We just documented it, right? But it's fascinating when you start to look at the interiors. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't find a, a better interior, right? Uh, interestingly it is that all with discarded ceramics. So imagine all the reuse, all of the philosophy of reuse that's inside this building. And look at this one, no? Uh, all fixed by, we helped, of course, these are the apartments that we later were helping to fit out. But stores on floor, and in different places, sports courts, competing gymnasiums. And then, but this was also, as uh, uh, Fred says, and we use the book, the film, to construct an idea 
that maybe could be recreated somewhere else, right? And we're still looking to recreate that idea of the future uh, Torre David Tower. So what if we build buildings with infrastructures like Havrakan says that are double height, right? We don't have to build every floor because people themselves can build those mezzanines. We saw those today in the squat, what do we call the last squat, which was the, tr the, 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 the house? Portobello. Portobello, yeah, yeah. And they were building their little mezzanines, no? So, but in the same way, why do we have elevators for every building? If, if we're going dance and up, why don't we have elevators as part of the public system? You know, and then we can connect cafes, restaurants, buildings all together. Why not? We could have a city with all of these elements that, that are very interesting and you could see things in between buildings as you went up, right? Okay, or you could connect through floors to public spaces as we saw in, 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 the, in Portobello, no? We saw a painting studios on roofs. How could we connect the city with all of those things? But maybe I'm dreaming, yes. But it's not to say because we have, as, as, uh, as Tessa told us, we have our iPhones, we can find things. We don't no longer, and when you did say that we wouldn't be able to find our friends in a rave or in a concert, we could because we've got their GPS, right? Have you tried it? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I've been so drunk. <laughs> okay, so this is, the, this is the new mapping, right? So what can we do? That's why this course in particular wants to digitalize the, the idea of how we can use that city, no? More and more and find a new city. So can Torre David be a prototype? Can we find other places? And we know, we, we talked to Piet, Peter, and parking garages are perfect. We know one just in front of the James Hotel. There's a big one, right? And it's wonderful typologies, right? They're all coming in little kits. We can arrange them as we want, you know, in modules. Can we use them just a little bit higher as new, as new structures? These Habraken structures, they're off the shelf, quick. We can build them, right? And here you see one in Caracas transformed. So there, it's coming from the south. The south is already doing it, getting rid of the cars, transforming the whole parking garage into, into part-time offices, living conditions, etc. And here we see it in Bangkok. Half parking structure, half uh, living above, right? Why is it that the western city is not doing this? Why aren't we libera uh, liberating the laws, the zoning laws, right? for people to do it. So we turned one in Trinidad and Tobago into a parking lot, into an emergency shelter for refugees. And here you see the conception of it, and it's got helipad, everything, and inside um, you, can, you can have all kinds of rooms and shelters, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is a bit of a gimmick, but it's only to, I did this quick, so all of you can think what you can produce for a little manifest. Right? Can we occupy the parking garage? This is actually just like the one in front of our hotel, which is inclined, you know? Yeah, it's cars, but maybe we can start to use it. Maybe it can be zoned specials at different moments of the hour, as Tessa said. Maybe it can change over time, you know? And maybe it's got a whole system of occupation that is by a clock, an, an iPhone, an app, something, right? You can rent your spaces, transform it, and here we kind of mocked up what that would be like, playing games, and you know. So our vision, the objective, is to improve residents' lives. That's why we're doing this course, right? To challenge the housing problems, right? Up front, and the capital commitment. The problem is it's too expensive to, to access housing, right? Or to mortgage, right? So what kind of non-subsidized solution do we need to do, right? Um, maybe there's other ways. As I said, maybe we can, we can get the land for free, but then it goes back to the city after 30 years, and the city benefits from some kind of income, right? The solution versus the developer model. What I want to get away from is no longer do we have to buy in to the idea of a mortgage, uh, owning the property, right, and then getting stuck for life. We're all mobile and then in little boxes, all the same, identical. 
So can we find that, that structure? Can we then appropriate it and do an experiment, right? Well, for who? Well, the first group I can think of is artists. All of you I'm considering as artists, right? So we have an initiative, we, you know, young artists. In this case, we were doing it for Greece, right? We get a partner, the municipality, maybe the fine arts school. We need a partner, institutional partners to put together. And then it's addressed to everyone who wants it. And then we can have all kinds of rules with the municipality, who gets appointed those spaces, who can use them, how can they be used, a little bit what we were listening to today in the squad. And how can we design that so that it's legitimate, so that the city, so obviously, you know, this is actually to be pulled in a trailer, right? So I thought about this pop-up city that we could do in any piece of property. It's like a little campground, right? So maybe that's a way, if there's a lot of space, in, in outside in farmland, the little, you know, space. But then, what are the essential, this is very mocked up, what are the essential things that we need to fit out a building? Can we make an IKEA of that? And, and how many people want to live together? Are there different forms of living, right? Probably, well, I'll just finish with this one, Kenya. So we went to Kenya, here's Kibera. This is amazing, this was a lake filled with garbage and then squatted. So they, they squatted it as they went filling up the lake. It's, it's amazing to fly over in Nairobi, right? We went there because we started to look with the World Bank. So to figure out $600, you know, um, or, or uh, $180 or uh, $50 monthly, you know, what they could pay for housing, you know, what, what's the market? And of course, this is the biggest market, right? It's poor people. So, um, and again, it was for artists, for a group of artists who were having huge careers. As you know, African art is hot in the market now. So we said, okay, but they're all painters, they're all painting in their little uh, informal houses. How can we then put a place that is near playground schools, etc.? And then we found a hardcore development. So let's go find in the city where a developer is going to do a major development and then grab a piece of it, right? Why not? That could be a way, right? So we found this abandoned space here, this triangle, right in this industrial area that's going to be transformed. And we started to, to make ideas very quick, modeling up this Habrakan thing. That's why there's no architecture in it. These are the buildings that are around. And um, trying to think, OK, so how can we make these artist lofts that are programmed differently with different activities, different functions all around? And here you see a little bit more of that. And then can you walk up? What would the building, could you know what was inside it on different floors? And it could be accessible. And then what are the different programs inside? And then this was on each level. As you come up the building, you turn, you find community space, you keep on going, you, uh, you back up and you climb up the building to another community space. Here you can see how that would be. So it would be a public building, and then with a very cheap facade in some way or another, right? So conflict as a creative tool is what I say. And with that, I stop. <laughs> Sorry? No, unfortunately, the, the government is broke. It had a huge debt to the Chinese, because the Chinese now are getting the oil wells. They built the train. And so the great idea they had was to sell the tower to the Chinese. And so they evicted all of the individuals. They gave them homes. There are, they all got what they wanted, so they're satisfied. In a sense, they knew they were on too good a piece of land. I couldn't convince the government to leave them inside and transform the building. It was our attempt, but people knew. But they got replacement housing, not in the center of city, but at 30 kilometers away. Unfortunately, some in La Guaira, in the beach, some in, in near Valencia, Maracay. But, uh, and then what happened? An earthquake, a mini earthquake came in Caracas. Uh, three years ago, and the parking garage is damaged. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese said, well, no, we don't want that building anymore. Oh, okay. and, and what you're saying is that the Torre David is kind of a model just to trying to plan 
self-organization yes and it's all written in the book how it was planned how it came about how we were thinking of sharing spaces and and retrofitting that tower but keeping the essential that was full functioning and, and do you think that you can when you look at Rotterdam is that something that we can well, I didn't find the squad of, of Portobello. Huh? No. Portobello. Portobello. I didn't find it that much different. Okay. It's a Torre David, but just smaller. Yeah. It just, you know, if it went up. So I find the essential in many cities. Zurich has squads still, you know, and all over Europe, even Oslo has squads. So um, the problem is there's no, in the city is not easy to let those transformations go through. We have to find a way to do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there questions at this moment? Is somebody... No? I have a question. No, um, it's a critical one. I, I hope we do it. Well, conflict as creative tool, great. Um, so, I think squatters in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they're uh, coming together by an ideology and they share like views on what life should be or what society should be. I was wondering in Tour de David, do you think it was the same or do you think those people were coming together there for anything else or driven by anything else than just poverty? No, they were actually a very strong knit community. Of course, I didn't say it. The head, squatters, the head honcho of the tower was, was El Nino Daza, a former criminal turned evangelist. You know, so he was a priest. He held a seminar every day in the tower, but he was carrying a gun. He had a gun in his, in his house. So he, anyone who stepped out of line, so he tried to, to instill no, he's true. what he tried to instill was, first, there was no crime in the tower. 60% of the tower was women and children. Imagine that. So, and, and it functioned, and you can see the video, which I didn't put on, and the movie. You can all watch it. You will see that they congregate together, they share the meat, they share the lifestyle, they shared clothing, they shared so many things. They helping each other finish their apartment. So, yes, they were a tight-knit community. They were. Driven by the need for shelter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. driven by, but the need for shelter is also, also the squats in, in Europe yeah. are a need for access to cheap housing. Yeah. And, and do you think that through like the flash mob you were talking about, that we could do something like that when we talk about affordable housing over here using flat mobs, like functional flat mobs? I like that idea. I do believe. We have to get enough momentum. I said it, let's go out to the alumni of IHS, etc. cetera. Um, I said, we need to create a movement. Without a movement, it won't happen. I think flash mobs are the way that I try to describe them. It's, it's not just a gimmick or like some, some virtual image, but it's a way of not, not just making uh, information open, like telling you about another subculture or telling you about all the empty uh, buildings, um, but really making this relatable. Um, and I think if you see these numbers of five and a half million square meters uh, vacant offices, what does it say? Like, how can you make that relatable when you walk through the city? How can you feel it when you walk through the city? I think that's what I mean by... Mm -hmm. So actually, how can we read the city better? Yes. And that's what Fred also said about the yeah. multi-layered identity or reality of the city. Yeah, definitely just our environment is multi-layered, it's information as much as it's physical yeah. environment. But I think what we are discussing here is the ability to have this interaction between what is what we discuss a lot about, those squad or those anti-squad, what is for instance the law, what is the ideology, what is the concept of living together, what is the value of property, as much as what is actually the doors that breaks the thing. So I, I think the complexity of the housing, as we have been discussing this morning, uh, maybe, 
uh, is that it's not just a physical entity, but it's also a very big uh, value. Mm -hmm. And it's a value that without anybody really understanding why, it's kind of doubling or, or becoming, you know, every, every five or 10 years, it's almost doubling price. Um, suddenly that value is something that people talk about, understand, or negotiate. But in fact, the value of housing, of sharing space together, of generating uh, a community of feeling at home, mm -hmm. a sense of security, of comfort, obviously against probably the rain, the mud, but also around our private life, our personal life, etc. All of those are many complex value. And uh, I think the, one of the big problems is to reduce it all to just a dollar sign or a euro sign and say, okay, if it has this, this is a value. But I think, you know, there are many, many other value, and it's interesting when the squatters kind of break that concept of saying, oh, it's not about money only, or it's not about money at all, but it's about other forms of uh, quality of life. Yeah. Then it opens huge possibility that, in fact, just we would like to see everywhere. But it seems people who are writing the law, people who are controlling, are interested in the economical value. And right now we're a little bit suffocated by this notion of capital as the only value. Um, yeah, because maybe the, the social value also costs money. So it's not only, so it, it can maybe cost more to have the quality of life in a better way. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to think Well, I think about. we have a number of crises that came suddenly that completely disrupted that, but I, I think with global warming, we are going to have ecological value that are going to be very important. How do you take that into account? Mm -hmm. uh, it was somewhat interesting, even so kind of tragic, that uh, that large tower in uh, Florida, in Miami, collapsed because they were negotiating about how much it would cost for each apartment to be renovating the structure, but then global warming or yeah. other things didn't wait for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we need to, to, to consider, and it was interesting in the squad that we saw, one of the other value that came in was uh, a, monu a historical monument. Suddenly it was a historical mm -hmm. monument, so you couldn't take it down, so you, but you had to repair it. So I think what Tessa is trying to say, or whatever I interpret from it, is that maybe we can map those other value, maybe we can map those other elements and make it visible to make it understandable. Well, a map is a critical instrument. You see what I'm saying? That's how we went to the city in Caracas. And we said we mapped, for instance, how many people were had just built another floor in their barrio unit on the hill of the Metro Cable. And we said, you're planning a road? You'll knock down 30, 40 uh, percent of the mountain to build a road to all those houses that have spent money. And, they, and that, we mapped that. And it became the instrument that said, oh, but we can build a cable car and fly over all those houses. So I think mapping is very important to use it because, and you know from forensic architects, Eyal Weissman, right? Maybe you know his work. His mappings are causing incredible uh, discussions and arguments. In fact, to the point where they didn't want to give him a visa to the United States because he's mapping so many delicate things. Yeah, so that's also one of the keys of the school, I think, the method, like researching first and then through mapping or other kind of empirical research to find out what the identity is and then uh, uh, try to find the program for it. So are there other questions? Yeah, I was wondering about the, uh, the concept that Tessa was talking about, this uh, permanently temporary. Because it uh, bears so many uh, resemblance to the, the concept that Zeus is always talking about, permanent temporality. Uh, and they use it as, a, as a, an idea for development, uh, basically on the scale of this block, of gradual development and not uh, sudden tabula rasa, demolition and then rebuilding. So, but you use it in a different way and all, also on a, a smaller, shorter time scale of that of 24 hours. Uh, and this whole uh, notion of uh, double use and uh, walking mold, as the uh, example says it all, um, I was, it's, it's very tempting and very, uh, you know, it raises a lot of uh, ideas. 
can it be uh, can housing be a part of this uh, of this scheme can it also be uh, shared in, can it be a mix with other uh, yeah so, so is it analytical or is it a design instrument well? um yeah that's why i said it, it kept coming back so i i wrote this thesis in 2013 before this <laughs> uh, but yeah um i think it's a it's a dangerous thing to build such a algorithm because well look at airbnb that's kind of that but then monetized and just trying to squeeze money out of every single minute in a building uh, when you're not there even um, but if um, you use it the other way uh, i'm now actually starting a project with the municipality in amsterdam on uh, homelessness uh, on, on housing homelessness um, what's the word for it shelter um, homeless shelters right so they don't have enough of those in Amsterdam at the moment and the city has all these empty offices that haven't been used in a year and they want to see if they can make it a flexible working space during the day and then a flexible sleeping place during the evening. Um, and I'm working out this design which is not just a spatial design but partly spatial so it could maybe be a table that flips to a bed um, but also organizational so that maybe a person who's in charge of the desk during the day has a certain relationship with the person who's in charge of the bed during the nights and you get this kind of crossover between the communities. Um, but also financial, like could you make this something that uh, could motivate companies like Spaces or WeWork to also become a shelter during the night without um, extracting too much data or, or squeezing the money out of this business model or yeah i think with any tool like this it could go like dynamite you can make tunnels and you can start a war um but yeah i, I think it could work with living as well for sure in good ways and in bad ways <laughs> well you guys all know that in um, in in india they ever almost every square and there's uh, and uh, in Ahmedabad, there's a very famous square where the cows come in at six and seven in the morning, and they put hay down, and they, it's an eating place for all the cows, sacred cows. Then they clean that up. Then uh, businesses open up at midday, and then uh, it, uh, when they then oh, sorry, they put out food and things and sales and, and informal vending, and then that closes down. And at six the party begins and then the square becomes all about people dancing over after work etc into the night and so that way of programming space or public space even or maybe related to the shop fronts is very interesting um yeah why in athens uh, we came up with an idea the 101 ideas for athens which is a book also which is when you can you can rent a shop front for an hour for two, for a day, for three days, why not? And we could have this dynamic thing with the city and the city should buy up all the shelf fronts. I mean, they're super good value to have, right? And then you can access shelf fronts or at least try it with, a, with, and the city then can do exhibitions or not, or it can give it up for different things that the city wants. Tons of uh, interesting combinations like that, but not so much with housing. That's why I'm asking, of course, we are not only talking about housing, but we do uh, talk about sort of right to the city, who, is, uh, who has access to the city, um, and um, the sharing a bed with an office clerk space uh, sounds hugely attractive to me, and it also reminds me of the 19th century uh, habit of uh, um, sharing one bed with three persons who all work, uh, you know, all sleep eight hours in the same day. And it's an interesting design question, though, like how can you design it in such a way that it, it's a positive experience? <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that is your challenge yeah. <laughs> to convince me. But how people want it? Like, we can design many things interesting for us, but the question is if people want what we design. Well, it's, it's, it's valuable, yes. Yeah. Well, let me give you an I, idea. I, I, can, I can give you an example that I, I was invited to give some lecture in uh, <coughs> Tokyo, and they pay for my hotel for like 
I think two nights, and I felt like I'm not going to go to Japan and fly back and forth, so I want to stay a bit longer. But I couldn't afford to leave this. So they pay me this hotel room, which is tiny, you have to, you know, close your knees if you want to open the door to go to the bathroom. But I had everything for me. I had my bed, I had my bathroom, I had my own, but so squished, but that was already way too expensive. So then I went to a capsule hotel where you sleep in this kind of tiny coffin and so on. But then you have a large living room that is shared by everybody. That is in fact relatively comfortable. You have a large bathroom which is also shared by everybody. So you know, it's, it's a kind of everybody is taking their shower kind of together and so on. But at least you don't bump your head into you know, the door. So, so it's not completely impossible to have typology where you, and I think we, we have seen that in squats, we have seen that in lots of even maybe student housing where maybe you have a very small bedroom, but you share a larger living room or you share a larger thing. So constraint in design doesn't mean necessarily that it's bad. In fact, it could have positive. And I think a lot of us have either found that we are actually living in kind of student, uh, Organization. I mean, student apartment where you put a lot of people in beds, but then you still have kind of a community, and it's kind of nice. Uh, and I don't know if it's nicer to have your own apartment by yourself without seeing. Yeah, that's people. exactly what I was going to say. If I I travel a lot to cities, right, and and sometimes they put us in hotel rooms, or sometimes you know you can get fortunate, you get an apartment or an Airbnb or something like that. And what a bore! You want to go and be within a city with friends and share things, right? So yes, you need to know what community you're going to plug into, but it's preferably 100% to be in a city with people with that you know of minds alike and who know the city well, and etc. So forming a community. So I think what the whole question is here is how do we want to live? But the but society is telling you know buy your own apartment, let you know live in your own little controlled environment. It's expensive, it roots you, but what's the modern way to live? What's the 21st century going to be about? Yeah, so um, I hope I can extend on this. Because uh, the, the goal for the summer school is to create a manifesto that we propose to the, um, to the municipality, but hearing your story about the vigilante of the David and this woman who was the organizer and hearing the stories of the, the crackers and the, the old man who was still in his house, in his neighborhood existed. Um, should we also uh, propose a manual on how you can resist the system uh, and demand uh, these changes? Uh, yes, so I think that What's scary about all of those examples you just yeah. said, whether it's a Nino Daza or the guy we just met yeah. or the girl we just met and, and the other squad is, and she was saying very, one of them was saying, hey, it's not always fun, huh? We're not always getting along and sometimes you need to escape yeah, and get out of here. Resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the real problem is, it's that the system, the way it's created for to create these communities and community living and sharing, is not easy, so it's creating a lot of anguish in people, right? She doesn't know if she's going to stay one day, three, three months, you know, etc. So it creates a lot of anguish, so she has to change her mindset. So her mindset went way the other way into kind of, you know, la-la land, right? Um, where I better not think about anything. Let's have just peace, right? Because imagine the pressure she's under is tremendous. Um, so, the, the point there is, what could be the new policies that could lead to new forms of living, that could lead to new ways to design, because ultimately we have to design these products. And I, think I, I, yeah, I, I, go ahead. I think when systems get too complex and too bureaucratic, the only thing and we don't really know how to read them and how to relate to them. The only thing we have left to do is to protest or contest or say we, we don't agree. But I think it would be even better if we would be able to take one step further and say, actually, this is how you could make an actionable system. So propose an alternative rather than say, not that. But yeah, of course, a protest is the first no, step. No, no, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, to to respond to to continue what, what I was saying earlier, um, somebody made a very interesting study on people who were owning some of the Rich, Richard's house in Connecticut, just outside of New York. Most of the time, it was people who I mean, they, they found a neighborhood where there were enormous houses with enormous piece of land around. Each house was worth multi-million. Most of those houses were used, in fact, by former lawyers who had made tons of money and then who divorced, and then they would sue each other, and then people, usually the woman would keep the, the house, the husband would go somewhere else. But then you had the single woman who were middle-aged, very, very wealthy, completely bored to their mind because they had no neighbor, they had no neighborhood. So in this kind of housing career that you were talking about this morning, uh, supposedly it was very successful, but that person made those really interesting interview where in fact they would almost keep the cleaning lady hostage, like stay, have some coffee, have some tea, uh, talk more, I'm all alone in my house. Usually they would fight with the neighbor also because they, they wanted to, whatever, preserve their property, etc. Having a large estate with a large house is not the same what makes you happy. No. So some of the question would be when we talk about mode of living or quality of life, I think it's very important to think of all the options, like do you want to live outside of the city, have your own little house, do you want to live inside the city but still have a little garden, do you live do you want to live with other people? I mean, ultimately, we are social animals. We like other people. You guys like to come into a workshop and work together, to think together. Um, but to what extent? To what extent, she was talking today about being in a squad where you have 30 people always living together, always this kind of commune, which can be overwhelming. Um, so I think it's, it's very important to think not just about what is being advertised as success, but really for you to think and to look at system of uh, communal living because we are in a city and a city is communal living in that sense. Uh, no, in return to the idea of value, what are we, what, what is the real value that we add? Is it monetary? Is it for us to have a pension and then to retire? And then as Tessa said, her parents live in a big house and they've got a garden. And then, you know, the pleasure of them is to have their family, which come and, and use the garden and the house and stuff, right? But that's, doesn't, that's 19th century almost thinking, right? Because it looks like 21st century's atomization. I don't think uh, all of you will often go home and, and have tea with your family, right, in the backyard. I think that kind of living is almost over. Okay. I think there are, oh, sorry. One last question. To a certain extent, we are kind of prettifying the squatting situation, or actually prettifying the kind of community living style. Because um, nowadays people are super diverse, and not maybe not everybody is thinking in that way. No, we only are, we're not endorsing squatting in no way. Or we, we're certainly not, we're interested in finding new ways to settle and come to the city and live in the city in comfortable ways, which we're not convinced it's so comfortable, this communal living yet, right? right? We're not so sure, right? Although you do have a friend in there, in one of them. But, but we're not sure. But the point is, we can't access the market anymore. We're, we're below the mortgage levels that can access the cheapest apartment in Rotterdam. So what do we do? And what model can we invent? This is the point of the studio. So I think that's a good final sentence. And also, um, we have two more weeks to, to go. Today was very exhausting also, but yes. very informative. And I think everybody needs to sleep or go home and, and reflect on and reflect and tomorrow we will be here again and um, thank you very much for all this very interesting information and we have thank to you for the tour today it was fantastic thank you I'm thank you for coming okay so we stop
now and have some drinks and then uh, tomorrow. And let's go tea. collectively to the park and do some Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.